Now, have you ever wondered how your brain is able to process things automatically without putting too much effort into it? So we're going to talk about a schema. Now, what is a schema? So let's say, for example, you hear the term winter. What comes to mind? You think about snow, maybe depending on where you live. I'm in South Florida, so we don't get too much of that. But it does get colder in the wintertime. You might think Christmas. That's a big holiday or one of the biggest holidays is during the wintertime. You might think what type of clothing you may wear, what type of activities go on, ice skating. The list goes on. Now, your brain draws all these conclusions just based off of the term winter. Since it's understanding what winter is, it doesn't necessarily have to process every bit of aspect that go with it. You don't have to think, wait, is Christmas during this time? Wait, should I put on a jacket? It just comes all inclusively because your brain needs to make these jumps because we take in a lot of information every day. Some need it, some not. So we had to put focus and effort to every little bit of information we put in, we would overload kind of like a computer in a general sense, not exactly. But basically, this is what a schema is. Now, sometimes our brain makes mistakes. It's not because it's broken or messed up. It's because it's a lot of information, like I said, and you jump to conclusions and that can help a lot. Sometimes those biases or mistakes can help you and you make the right choice, but at times they don't. Now, the reason I'm bringing any of this up is because we're going to talk about today on the Mental Breakdown Podcast, the Stroop Effect. Now, you may be thinking, what is the Stroop Effect? Well, you probably heard this term. And if you haven't heard this term, you've probably seen it somewhere. I've seen it as a filter on TikTok. People have told me it's being used a lot. And it's even one of the most cited research studies in experimental psychology with over 14,000 citations. So what the Stroop effect is, is when a word is shown and is not matching the ink of the word written. For example, the word red would be written in blue ink, but you would have to call it blue because it's the color, not the word that we care about. Now, today we're going to go over the history of the Stroop effect, what it is, how it came to be. I'm going to talk about some of the science and what the brain is actually doing and make sense of it. And also how it can be applied to your everyday life to help your brain get better and get your mind right. So let's start off with the history of it. Now, why is it called the Stroop effect? That, that's an interesting sounding word, right? Well, it's actually named after someone, John Ridley Stroop or J.R. Stroop for short, was an actual person. He was a psychologist and he was doing his dissertation. And he wanted to study how our brain handles interference. So he used the same concept I just explained, but the original study had three conditions. First, he would read the words that were colors, red, green, yellow, blue, orange, purple, brown, and they'd be written in black ink. So this is the neutral condition. So they would read a list of these words as fast as possible. So it would time how long it would take to go through the whole list. Now, that was a control. Now, the second part was the words now were read and a color. Now, this time the color would not be congruent with what the word said. So it'll be red written in blue, green written in yellow, purple written in brown, and so forth. And as the first part of the study, they would read the words as fast as possible and we'd time if there was a difference, and there was, because now there's an interference of knowing what the color says versus what the color is, and it takes a little bit more processing to stop yourself and saying what the actual color word should be. Now, in the third condition, it just had blocks of the said color. So color red, color blue in a block form, and you would have to say it. So now we're comparing the times it takes to do each condition. Now, the goal was to say, one, does this cause an interference? And yes, it does. Now, after we saw this, this experiment would go on to be used in different variations and different forms. And John Ridley Stroop probably doesn't even know how impactful his research has been in less than 100 years. So before we get into the science, let's go over what the Stroop effect looks like in real time. So I want you to tell me what the word says. So this is a neutral condition. So even though it's written in black ink, it says red. So you would read that as red. Now, the next one, I want you to tell me the color of the ink, not the word written. So this one, it says red and is written in red. So you would say red because it's congruent. So either way, it doesn't matter. You're going to say red. Now, this last one, I want you to say the color of the ink again. So it says blue, but it's written in red ink. So I want you to say red. So that's how it works. That's the original Stroop effect and how it was presented. So you would have to read the words as fast as can based on the actual word in the neutral condition and the actual color of the ink in the other conditions. Now, Going back to schemas, why is this important? 
like I said, our brain has taken a lot of information, so we have to be able to be mindful of how we analyze things and operate in the world around us. So let's talk about other types of schemas, what comes to mind. So in general, when you think of, say, a restaurant, when you go to a restaurant, you don't really have to think about what to do when you walk through the door and get directed of, hey, what, what's next? You know that you walk through the door, you might see the person who seats you, the hostess or host, and then they sit you at a table. You wait for your server to come. And once they come, they take your orders and they'll bring you your drinks and appetizers. You put in the full meal. And after a few minutes, the full meal comes, you eat it. And then after you eat it, you ask for the check, you pay and you leave. All that has to take place. Now, it sounds pretty straightforward because you've probably been to a restaurant a few times in your life, but all that takes different steps and processing. But our brain knows the scenario of being in a restaurant and what comes with it. Let's use another example. Let's say police officers. When you think of police officer, a lot of things might come to mind. You might think someone who's heroic, brave, authoritative, uh, tough, or depending on your views, you might think other things. The point is, it all comes to mind immediately. Now, the thing with schemas, they can also lead to other forms of processing and even biases such as stereotypes. Now, this is where maybe a negative implication or positive stereotypes can go both way can come in. And now your brain takes in the term, let's use police officers again, depending on what you believe. You might think that, hey, they just want to be authoritative, a big shot and put people under circumstances just to seem like they're bigger or stronger or better than someone. A lot of people starting to think that now, given the media attention to police, given all that's been going on in the last decade or so. Or you might think a stereotype is police like donuts. That's a... a very used trope, but my dad is actually a police officer and I can confirm that not all police care about donuts like that. But you get the point, your brain jumps to these. You've seen it probably in media, cartoons. You don't have to even think about it. You hear police, you think donuts. You hear police, you think high octane, high speed chases. You, you see catching the bad guy, reading the Miranda rights. All these terms come to mind when you think of police. Now, when it comes to the more political side, I don't want to go too deep into this, but when people talk about, oh, they're bad, they're killing innocent people, this is a kind of bias because you think, wait, police, they carry what? Guns. This is automatically associated no matter what the police may or may have not done, but you know a gun is dangerous. So all these connect the dots to that conclusion of, oh, they're bad police because guns, guns shoot, and there's been killings. Even though that may not be the case, your brain is filling in these gaps. And you can see how this can go the wrong way. Now, there's different types of things that happen, like cognitive biases, and that one right there could be more so towards the availability heuristic bias, is when you assume the most readily available information is true because you might hear about police shootings all the time, then therefore you think they happen very frequently, but in fact they don't. Statistically, they don't happen as much, especially with unarmed people. Yes, police shootings do happen, but not as frequently and very rare when it's unarmed people. But it does happen. But you assume it's more because your brain needs to fill in that blank. And since it knows, oh, I've heard 10 times in the last month of different shootings. And now you assume that's the norm. So how does the Stroop effect play into all of this? So Stroop effect is a little bit different when it comes to how it processes and how your brain takes in information. So there's different theories of why our brain slows down to interpret the words or the color. Now, one of them is the parallel distribution theory. So this reports that it happens because when we hear a word opposed to a color, it's much more frequent that we have to process reading than we do colors in real time or in the real world. How often do you go outside and say the sky is blue, the grass is green, the sun is yellow? It's something that you see, but you're not really giving too much attention to it. But we're always reading books or texts or billboards, signs, whatever it may be. So our brain makes more sense of it because it knows us much more. So that's one theory of why we may process the word quicker than the color. Therefore, we have to slow our brains down and stop to then change what we need to say to say the correct color term. So that's just one way to look at it. Another way to look at it I like to use when I teach this to my students is how we normalize the context of words and objects versus colors. Colors are pretty abstract. So let's try this, this thought experiment. Let's say I was born blind and I've never seen anything in my life. Now, I ask you, could you describe the color red to me? Go ahead, go and try it. Now, what came to mind if you're going to tell me what the color red is? You might have said, it's like fire. 
or a rose, an apple, hot, burning. These are all terms that I've heard and my brain knows what they mean. But yet I still can't get closer to what the color red looks like because it's more of an abstract descriptive term of something else. Now, if we use the same concept of, okay, describe to me what a house is. Well, it has four walls, a roof, a door, uh, furniture inside. Now, when you describe that, I can make more sense of what a house is. It's going back to that parallel theory in a sense, because you know what a house is. I don't have to see a house as a blind person, but I know what it is. I know the function of it, whether it be a house, a chair, a book, the functionality doesn't change and I can utilize those, but I never really used or had a functional use of the color red or blue or whatever it may be. So this is how I look at sometimes why the Stroop effect can take precedent and it slows you down in your process. So there was a study in 2002 where they hypnotized participants to not see the actual written word as actual language, but see it as scribble. So they did the test and they saw little to no difference in the processing with most participants because instead of having to read it, they just saw the colors. So it kind of took away that interference part. It's kind of like something they did back in the 60s where they would have Russian spies read the Stroop effect in their native language because for them in Russian, they would see the words written in Russian and process the actual color word and slow down and they would think, okay, if they had to slow down on reading that word, it's because they know the Russian language. Now, if they're an English speaking person and they're not a Russian spy, they would assume it would just look like scribble to them because they don't know what Russian is or how to read it, I should say, and they would go faster. So you can't really hold that too strongly, but it makes sense because if you don't have to process the actual word itself, it just would override it and then you would read the color as is without having to be interfered by the word. Now, there's some other implications with this in the real world, because a lot of times we think about, we hear these research studies and it's huge in experimental psychology and cognitive psychology, but there's clinical aspects that's starting to get used to as well over the last few decades. So there was a study where they took people with general anxiety disorder as well as social phobias and also a control group with people who didn't have any disorder and they gave them the Stroop test, but they used words where there was emotionally charged words. So this is also known as the emotional Stroop test. And the words will be relative to people who have general anxiety disorder and social phobias, as well as neutral words that were more positive as well. Now, they saw that the general anxiety disorder group were slower to process when the words were negative or associated with anxiety, but also when they were positive as opposed to the neutral words. So this may be chalked up to the fact that if you see a word that's more inducive to your stressful states or dealing with anxiety, because remember, anxiety entails worries, ruminating on thoughts that may or may not happen or things that you don't want to happen, but end up putting all your attention to. You can see how this could slow you down in your processing because you're giving more effort to that word. But the fact that it were slower also in the positive words, maybe because they don't use them as much. So now it's giving that attention to wait, wait, what, what is this? So this is interesting to see because from an emotional standpoint, we do internalize what we read or what we see, depending on what relevance we give to it. Because in the emotional stroop, I'll show an example. They'll show a neutral word like this one. So table is written in blue ink. Regardless, you have to process the ink color blue. And then if you give it a more anxiety-driven word like knife, and it's written in green ink, you would have to say green, but the processing may slow down because it's a more triggering or more emotionally charged word. So there may be some issues when it comes to these type of emotional troops studies, because even though the emotionally charged word may trigger a response, they say that maybe the word length could play a factor because if there's more words, you can argue that it takes more time to process because the word is just longer. So they say there should be more implications of having same word length too. So this is just an idea and it, like it's making sense of how this affects our actual brain and our processing. So why does this all happen from more of a neuroscience aspect? What's happening in our brain? What's being processed that we have these lack of judgments, have these interference? So let's talk about three regions, the prefrontal cortex or the PFC, the anterior cingulate cortex or the ACC, and the ventral tegmental area, VTA. Now these three areas play interchangeably because with the prefrontal cortex, this is the region that really makes us human. This is where we plan out goals, process behaviors, judge things, regulate emotion. So this is where we plan things out and go about doing certain tasks. So with the Stroop effect, 
the goal would be, say, the color of the ink and not the word. Now, the ACC or the anterior cingulate cortex, this is error detection. So this is making sure, wait, was I supposed to do that? So think inhibition or impulse control. Now, the VTA is more so the reward center. So talk about dopamine response to motivate behavior. So in a general sense, this makes us be able to, one, plan out what to do, make sure what we're doing makes sense or is correct, and getting rewarded or reinforcing said behavior or action so we know to do it again in that same way or alter it to make it better. Now, I like to use an analogy when I teach this to my students of the ACC relationship with the PFC and the VTA. So I use the example of walking your dog. So if you have a dog, you have a leash and the owner, they're going for a walk. Now, let's say the dog gets a little aggressive or rowdy, and you have to restrain them. Think of the prefrontal cortex as the owner. They control where the dog goes, what it does, the decisions, how it's fed, treated, all of that stuff. Think of the leash as the anterior cingulate cortex. So it's recognized when things aren't going right or behaviors that need to be stopped, you tug on the leash to bring them back. And think of the VTA as giving them a reward or a treat. So this relationship, as you see it goes, we go for a walk, my dog's behaving well, we get back in, I give it a treat and give it a pet, good boy, right? Or if it starts going places not supposed to, I have to give it a little tug and reinforce like, no, don't go there. That's my neighbor's yard. We don't do that on their lawn, right? So this is a, an example to make more sense of it. So, you know, because all the technical stuff can get overwhelming sometimes. But all in all, this relationship is important because when we're processing information. Like I said, we make biased decisions, misjudgments and errors all the time. This is just human nature. We're very fallible. The brain, as powerful and great as it is, makes lots of mistakes. And we can override this by practicing and doing different training modalities to make it better. So this is why with Mind Body One, my company, we implement different tasks where you can get better at these types of drills from a cognitive standpoint, and then it can make you better overall. So let's talk a little bit about different types of apps and features of the Stroop Effect. Now, there's an app called Soma MPT that I use very regularly with my clientele. This is great, has a lot of different features, not just with the Stroop Effect, but over 60, 70 cognitive tasks that you can implement. It's very analytical. It uses uh, statistics such as reaction time, variance, uh, rate of correct score, meaning the rate how fast you are when you're correct as opposed to wrong, speed, which is the rate of your response, which is important because if we have reaction time and we have speed, let's say we have two people who have the same average reaction time. So that means the average, say, half a second. But how do we know who's better in this case? Well, speed will tell us how frequently at the rate of their responding, meaning if I have half a second reaction time of both people and person A had a speed of 2.9 where person B had a speed of 3.7, I can see that person B was fast, but fast more frequently. So that's saying like if person A got 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.7, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.4, 0 0.8, 0 0.4, very erratic all over the place. But person B got 0 0.49, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.49, 0 0.58. So they're, they're being reactive in the same manner and consistent. So this is what we get and see with the Soma MPT app. I'll put the link down below if you're interested in checking it out. There's also other Stroop tasks that I implement, like the numerical Stroop. So this is one way to do it. You see the word written out four, but there's only two of them. You won't say the word. You're going to say how many you see, which is two. So that's numerical Stroop in the word form. And also we use the number form. So you see three fives, you ignore the number five itself, the numeral, but you would say three because there's three of them. So when we do our drills of mind by the one, whether we're working with pro athletes, military, kids, businesses, the list goes on. We implement different versions of these where we'll have them doing different tasks like the Stroop effect with either reactionary lights to respond to, to have the external stimulus and peripheral vision. So you're adding more cognitive load. And we'll also do it dynamically where it'll show the Stroop color and you run to the colored cone that matches. It'll show the numerical Stroop and it'll be a color that they have to correspond to with that and say it out loud. So you're always having things go. Now, the importance of this, you can say, okay, this is cool. It gets my brain going, but why? Well, when we want to build the brain, building those neuronal pathways, getting more consistent, familiar in your processing, we can measure this and put them over a load just like with fitness. You can't just do five push-ups and say, I'm strong. Just like with mental training, you can't just do 
a little bit of reading or do a crossword puzzle and say I'm mentally tough or mentally efficient. You have to do tasks that actually challenge these different traits or features. Now we go back to say like the ACC, when you do drills like this, you're actually training that region to pick up on the different processes so you're able to analyze how consistent you are and measure that and you can get better over time. Also from a more mental health standpoint, this is a part that not many people talk about is that when we deal with things such as anxiety, worry, stress, uh, even depression, it's because we reciprocate different behaviors or lack thereof that make us less adequate or feel bad about ourselves. When we talked about the PFC, the VTA, and the ACC, you see this relationship involves setting a goal, carrying out said goal properly, and getting rewarded and keep going in a cycle of that. That's exactly what this type of training does. Granted, it's not exactly like a real life situation where you maybe get dumped by a girlfriend or a boyfriend or lose your job or have just have a tough time going, but you can simulate the stress response. And I've talked about this on my video with stress because it's perception. So if I can perceive my abilities and staying consistent and making the correct options, and even if I mess up, reinforcing that I can keep going, you're now wiring your brain to be less susceptible to errors, mistakes, misjudgments and reinforcing that you can improve and once you get better consistently you can see how much times can i repeat said performance which can reinforce how confident you are and it just goes full cycle so now you can applicably train how well you respond to external stimuli and be able to process information with the stroop effect now i know that was a lot of information and i love telling it and the stroop effect goes way deeper so if you're interested in learning more i'll leave information down below how to get different programs like our brain active training program that's available now so you can do these different type of tasks with yourself or your clientele if you work with populations so thanks for tuning in make sure you like comment and subscribe and as i always say thank you for letting me break it down and get your mind right